Okay, welcome everybody to our 2023-2024 speaker series hosted by the Big Data AI Hub at the Institute for Management and Innovation here at the University of Toronto. My name is Irene Wysek and I'm a Professor of Accounting and Director of the Big Data AI Hub. Our goal with this seminar series is to engage our stakeholders in conversations about big data, artificial intelligence, and other emerging technologies. An especially important topic that seems to be on everyone's minds since OpenAI's release of ChatGPT in November 2022 is generative AI, which is a large language model. There are many concerns about how this immensely powerful technology is shaping our world, with new enhancements and adoptions coming almost daily. But there are opportunities as well, including opportunities for us to augment our human intelligence through use of these and other technologies that are being paired with ChatGPT. How will these technologies affect the way we work, the way we learn, and how we live? I want to thank Professor Michael Marin, who's on the call here today, for lining up an excellent group of speakers for this and our next set of seminars, which will include topics such as AI and healthcare, prompt engineering, and responsible AI. All of these uh, sessions will be in June and July. Please see our website and feel free to register. These are free, open to all and online. Before we introduce our speaker today, please note that this session is being recorded. And if you have questions, which we welcome, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. So let's get on to today's topic. So for today, we're excited to introduce Akib Azim, VP Strategy and Innovation at Wisdom. He's going to talk a little bit about chat GPT 4.0 and use cases for enterprise. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Akeep. Awesome, thanks, Irene. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, we'll kind of go through a couple slides. And I think at some point, I'd like to also show an example of how it's being leveraged um, in a product setting as well. So quick agenda, um, I, I'll, I'll give a quick intro into Wisdom, uh, the company I work for, um, and then we'll go into the industry use cases of, of chat GPT, generative AI kind of solutions. Um, and then I'll also talk about why analytics matters in terms of analyzing uh, these kind of advanced generative AI bots, um, something that everyone kind of uh, doesn't focus on today is what's the aftermath of, of these kind of generative conversation and who's analyzing to understand what's actually going on um, post conversations. So again, a little bit about me. I'm a Kibazim. I'm Vice President of Strategy Innovation. Uh, I've been at Wisdom for just under four years now. Uh, previously, I used to run product for Wisdom. Um, and before Wisdom, I used to be in management consulting, part of Deloitte's artificial intelligence practice, Omnia. Um, so uh, I've been in the AI space for, for quite some time now. A little background into Wisdom. Um, Wisdom is a conversational AI company. Uh, Wisdom has been around for over a decade now. Uh, we've essentially, um, we run a lot of the large chatbot management practices across uh, North America. So I'm sure you probably recognize a lot of the logos here. We run their chatbots. So if you're interacting with some of these brands, chatbot solutions, Wisdom's behind the scene that actually runs the solution for them. Um, and the way we kind of work is our goal is to make these solutions smarter and better. And large language models, generative AI is another avenue that kind of advances these capabilities, gives more uh, tools for our teams to develop more advanced use cases. So for these brands and other ones that uh, we couldn't put on this page, uh, what we're hoping to do is build more sophisticated uh, solutions where the customer experience is going to be more advanced and more bespoke for, for that specific customer. And we, again, uh, because we've been doing this for so long, um, we know kind of the ins and outs of what's capable on the AI side and, and even what's not, right? I think that's important to know. Great, I'm gonna do a quick, and just because I know I see there's a lot of people on the call, um, I don't know how familiar everyone is with, um, 
large language models compared to NLU, which is natural language understanding. I'll just go, do a quick uh, kind of walk through. Um, so natural language understanding is a supervised kind of approach. Um, so the way I kind of describe it is uh, the, ex the previous bots that existed out there, like Power Vir Virtual Agents, which is a Microsoft product, or Dialogflow, which is a Google product, they essentially, um, you're bucketing your conversations into, um, into categories. And the way it works is uh, humans go in and they build out these uh, buckets, and the AI model is based off what the customer is coming in and asking questions around puts them into one of the um, I think a keep is frozen. Hey, sorry, I think I uh, cut out for a second. Yeah, if you could just reshow your screen and keep, sorry about that. Oh, yes, no problem. There we go. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, perfect. Good. Okay, awesome. So as I was kind of describing this, um, this bucketing process is where AI is being leveraged today. Um, a lot of human interaction to actually build out these chatbots um, and to maintain these chatbot solutions. So. People have to go and build out these intents. And then as customers ask questions, uh, has to be pushed towards a specific intent. The problem with th this existing solution is you probably have interacted with chatbots before and they continuously say, I don't understand. And that, that problem exists because uh, there's a lot of different things you can ask a chatbot um, and there's only very specific use cases it's been trained on. Versus now that with the advent of large language models, they've been trained on a, a massive corpus of data, like swaths of the internet, um, books, articles, videos, photos. Um, and what this has allowed solutions like ChatGPT to do is do more than just um, push it, uh, try to find an answer within a specific bucket. It has swaths of data to actually work in. Um, it has you know, ways to be able to kind of search and find the answer that you're kind of looking for, summarize the answer, do things like clustering, extracting, um, doing all that in the chatbot solution itself, right? So um, OpenAI has made this very accessible through um, in ChatGPT's solution that's out today is the, the GPT 3.5 boosted version. And now with GPT-4, um, these capabilities have become much more advanced just based off the the larger data sets that they've been trained on and this is where gpt4 is going to really make strides I, I, I some of you might already have access to gpt4 um and the difference between gpt3 and gpt4 is primarily yes it's going it's much larger it's been trained on more data it's been trained on more recent data but then also it's trained on multimodal data um so GPT-3, you can now, uh, compared to GPT-3, you were able to only provide text and you get an output of, of text versus the new GPT-4 solution once fully released, you would be able to input things like audio, video, and text and be able to get outputs of audio, video, and text as well, right? The model will be able to understand uh, things you would be able to just naturally speak to it or send videos to it and be able to kind of really comprehend uh, what you were kind of saying instead of just typing it out how you would traditionally do it. Um, and this is an example of like how it would kind of work, right? You can send it uh, a photo. It would be able to understand. You can send it like images. It would be able to understand. So it's very, it's going to really change the way we we kind of interact with chatbots. Um, and the way Wisdom kind of looks at this is because we're deploying a lot of these solutions for customers, uh, what's key is how this is going to help specific use cases that the customer is looking to resolve that they would, weren't able to resolve previously, that you would need to have 
uh, a human agent kind of pick up the phone or you know come on Zoom or come on um, on FaceTime to be able to answer those type of questions that need a visual kind of element to it. I'll walk through a couple examples of how we're already prototyping some of these solutions for customers. Um, I'll give you some. I'll give. I'll walk through three specific use cases that we're looking to develop for customers. Uh, one being uh, a, a paint bot for a retailer. So, what customers will come? Um, this is a specific example uh, where a customer is going to look for um, the chatbot to actually help them with a redesigning effort of of their living room. So a customer would come in and say, my living room paint color is very gray. What colors do you have in store that would add life to the room? And then they would be able to send a photo of their living room. Um, and the way the solution would work is not only does it understand the text that was sent, but then it understands the context of the living room photo that you've sent with the text. And the response would be, you know, the chatbot now understands, processes that image of the photo, and says, you know, with your great couch and decor, I would recommend the following colors. And thankfully, all are available at your closest store. So not only does it understand you're an authenticated customer, um, knows your previous purchasing patterns, knows what you've bought, um, and then also based off your information that you provided, uh, knows, you know, your closest store, can give you recommendations like, you know, Farm Fresh, Canyon Dusk, and Laguna Blue. And you can see in each one of these, what the model will be able to, uh, is, is able to do is now output um, an AI generated image with your living room with different colors in the background that's available within the store. So more than just kind of providing you the hex colors for what you would need to go into the store to look for, um, and you have no visualization of what, what that would look like, it's able to kind of custom create this for you so that now you have an understanding of what your living room would look like with these kind of colors. Um, and then of course you can ask it for, for more, for, you know, you can refine your search even further um, without ever having to actually spoken to a real live human. And this is, this is important. Uh, speaking to humans is actually very expensive, surprisingly even today. And this price is, is this cost is going up um, so having automation at the forefront of handling these type of complex kind of use cases is going to be key for enterprises. Another example is a telco use case um, for a technician bot. I'm sure you've ta talked to a lot of, um, you know, humans that when you're having issues with your modem, but an example would be is, you know, you would come in and say, I think I'm setting up my modem all wrong. Uh, can you watch this clip of me doing a uh, clip of me and tell me what I'm doing wrong? And you can actually send them a video. Um, and so, uh, for example, Rogers is one of our customers today. Um, so if you talk with Anna on Rogers or you talk with Jack on Fido, you're talking to a wisdom solution. Um, and what you would normally, you know, what Anna and Jack sometimes won't be able to do that might you have to be passed on to a human would kind of require, you know, the human would uh, has capabilities of, you know, sending you a link by you clicking on it, activating your camera, and then you can kind of show your camera around in terms of modems. And that's how some of those complex use cases are solved today. Uh, so not necessarily can be solved on Anna and Jack as of now, but this is an example of what the possibilities could be, right? So you, you would send a video to the bot itself. You would not actually have to send it to a human. Um, and then the bot would is able to say like at one minute, 32 seconds, you are plugging the yellow cable into the WAN slot when you should be plugging into the LAN slot, you know, happens to the best of us. And that's the solution for your problem. Not only was it able to analyze your, your video and tell you exactly what you're doing wrong, um, it's able to even have some humor into, you know, that conversation. Another use case uh, is within banking, um, I'm sure everyone hates doing their taxes, um, but as you know, this is a very streamlined process. Um, year over year, I'm sure you're you're probably thinking like, how how do I automate this more and more, right? Tax spots are definitely going to be a big thing, uh, and they're going to be kind of launched across all 
all different banks. Um, so simple as, can you do my taxes? Uh, here's my T4. I only bank with your bank, so everything you have is up to date. And of course, your bank has all your information, your credit card information, your savings, checking, all that good stuff. Um, and you know, your bot can even say things like, congrats on the bonus this year. It looks like you're killing your sales numbers. You know, consider a GIC, try to upsell you. Um, and then even say, you know, complete your taxes and say, here's a receipt, right? So as simple as, uh, you know, three messages, it's able to kind of complete your, your taxes for you. So this is the kind of out of the possible of what we're looking to kind of build out for customers and what, where we're heading uh, towards in these kind of more complex use cases. Today's use cases are obviously much more trying to answer the the questions you would hope it should be able to answer. Um, the ones that people always think chatbots you know, suck. Uh, why aren't they able to answer these basic questions? I think that's the first goal, handling those simple questions that the bot should be able to answer and then move on to some of these more complex kind of use cases. And one thing to note with generative AI bots is there's still a lot of issues. Um, I'm sure you've seen this. I think there was, uh, as soon as ChatGPT was kind of announced, there was a lot of hype uh, around all the kind of capabilities it's able to do. And then you probably noticed like a week or two after that, then everyone was kind of posting all the things it can't do. Um, so it's important to know its limitations. It's not necessarily a black box. Uh, so there is things you can do to actually improve and advance it, um, but you can't rely on it to solve the situation itself. It, just because you're training it on more data, um, just because the use cases are, are now kind of inbuilt into the solution doesn't mean it's going to get things right every time, right? And uh, even OpenAI's um, team has kind of made this very clear. The models are getting better, but they're not perfect. And you're dealing with enterprise customers. Um, as an enterprise, you don't ever want to give an answer to a customer that you're not 100% uh, certain of. And also the process that we normally have to go through today to get a, a bot's response of what they would normally have to say has to go through so much vetting naturally uh, with their content teams of what the, is it on brand? How do we actually respond to these type of questions? Uh, so allowing a gender AI bot to say whatever with whatever type of personality um, is going to be an issue. So that's where we're looking to kind of add the guide rails, make sure that it doesn't go off script. Um, and of course, make sure it's giving the right answer, not uh, wrong answers with, with confidence. And this is where, this is what I think the industry is kind of heading towards. I don't think Gener AI will necessarily replace the traditional bots, um, but we're already seeing this. It's already complementing existing NLU uh, chatbots and voice bots. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the way it's doing this today is if you're building any of these solutions on, on Google, on Microsoft, on Amazon, even any of the mid-market chatbot solutions, you'll notice that when they've added generative AI capabilities, it's more of let's use the existing NLU framework that teams have trained and built out these supervised chatbot solutions. And anytime that answer is going to be, I don't understand, then let's look at the generative capability to see if there's something on the website that they've scraped uh, to be able to answer that type of question. So now it's it's using Gener AI and, and ChatGPT and GPT-4 to answer questions that maybe the it is, it's not answered on the first time with the NLU bots, but using it as a backup. And even if the backup um, it doesn't have a certain level of confidence, then the bot will come and say, I don't understand. So now we have multiple layers of uh, the bot trying to answer the question instead of escalating you to a human uh, right away. So this is this is going to get obviously right now it's let's say eighty percent of the questions are still answered by NLU frameworks. Maybe twenty percent is generative AI. I'm sure this is going to flip and it's going to be eighty percent generative answers and then only twenty percent is 
specific custom um, NLU framework kind of workflows. Uh, and at some point in the future, I, I'm sure we're going to get to close to 100%, but not anytime soon. Uh, humans are always going to be part of the loop. It'll always be some sort of a hybrid approach. Um, and the reason humans need to be part of the loop is no company is going to let up uh, let go of its brand recognition to to a chatbot solution to answer how it feels like. And the way uh, we see this transition happening is with current gen bots, um, you know, with the way that they're exist they've been built uh, is based off intents. Um, there's some there's some good analytics. This is where we focused on uh, with our product, which is our operation center product. Uh, so that kind of provides the analytics for how your bot is doing. And this is where it's important to understand your old chatbots, the ones that everyone was thinking are really shitty. Um, those ones are just saying, I don't understand for questions that they don't know. And that was fine because then it was a clear uh, a you know a clear focused answer where the bot doesn't understand a question, you have a clear answer of I don't understand. Versus the next gen bots, even if they don't understand your question, they will try to answer it, right? Um, and they will try to answer it to a level um, where even with the you know with the context it knows, it's going to give a very wrong answer and it's going to give it with a lot of confidence. And this is very dangerous um, because customers don't know any different. It thinks you understood them, understood them, and and they're this is the answer. Um, so this is where you know wisdom comes into play. We've been kind of analyzing these conversations, understanding what bots have been saying, what they actually need to be saying instead. Uh, so instead of just saying you know for the old gen bots like I don't understand, this is actually what you should have said. But then even for the next gen bots it's kind of giving a wrong answer and where we, our models are determining, hey, that was actually a wrong answer and you shouldn't have said the, you know, this bot shouldn't have said that, but this is what it should have said. So training more, uh, training those old bots, but and also the new, new next gen bots um, is going to be key in analyzing. And this is where analytics come to the play. Analyzing these conversations on a daily basis is going to be key. Um, to make sure that these bots are getting smarter and better, um, other than just you know building larger larger language models. And we do that through software. I won't get into this too much, but uh, we have you know proprietary software we've been building for over a decade now um, that does this, that analyzes every conversation. So no one is kind of reading conversations, um, every single conversation. Um, that's this is models that are analyzing the conversation, aggregating it to a higher level, um, and then being able to kind of produce outputs and reporting on how the bot kind of performed. Obviously, we have access to a lot of the data, <clears throat> but uh, there's a security and safety compliance <clears throat> baked into that. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about that in a, in a second as well. Um, actually, here, I'll, I'll switch over to the product itself. And I'll show you an example of how large language models um, were leveraging on the solution. So every conversation, like from a compliance standpoint, we're doing PI or redaction. So before any of these conversations come into you, um, are into the solution, you'll probably notice, uh, you know, these dots or where it's been redacted. So the models actually don't need your name or your address or credit card information, <clears throat> it's not that useful uh, for the models. So we redact all that information before it gets pulled into the solution. And what this allows us to do is now we're just analyzing the raw conversation of like what actually happened. Um, and the way we're using large language models is, as you can see, some of these conversations are very long, right? If you think about this is a chat conversation, but if you're on, if you're in a conversation on the phone, you know how the starting of the conversation goes, everything is being recorded uh, for security and training. Um, and think about your, if you're on the phone for an hour uh, and all those, you know, the conversations you're having for that hour, those are pretty long transcripts. And the model is analyzing all of those transcripts. And what we're able to do with large language models is uh, 
do things like summaries, right? So if I if I hit this, instead of you reading this very long conversation, uh, you can see there's a summary of what actually happened in this conversation. So the customer wanted to return chairs bought online and asked if uh, they needed to be disassembled before returning. The bot provided general information about the return policy, but was unable to answer the specific question about disassembling the chairs. The customer requested to speak to an agent, and then the agent explained that the disassemb disassembling of the chair was not necessary if returning to the store and provided detailed instructions uh, for the return process, blah, blah, blah. So allows you in just a couple bullet points, analyze the conversation. This is a use case of how large language models are used, not for just answering questions, but then analyzing conversations uh, and making these conversations better, knowing where to actually fix the solution on the chatbot. And this allows us to do things like cost savings for the customer, um, right? This is a retail case study where <clears throat> um, for our large uh, retailer, Canadian retailer, um, that we were able to save about $10 million in annual savings just last year. Um, through these kind of optimization and improvement capabilities where now it's able to handle much more advanced use cases, uh, take on more conversations instead of passing it over to a human. Uh, usually talking to a human is about, you know, if we're talking about costs, it's about like $10 to talk to a human per hour or per conversation uh, versus getting, you know, uh, being managed on the bot is we're talking about, you know, a couple cents. So you really want to drive a lot of your volume to your chatbots and not have them escalate to a human. So a lot of these cost savings is just based off how well you're able to automate and handle those more complex use cases. And that's where, you know, with more advancements in the large language models and generative AI space, we'll be able to take on more and more complex use cases um, as I was kind of showing, but even being able to do things like multiple tasks other than that one singular task where the bot, I'm sure you've seen those examples of um, they give ChatGPT a task to go and achieve and it goes and use multiple websites and it kind of navigates the internet and solves those problems, uh, be able to do those type of more advanced kind of use cases. Uh, and obviously with, with the strong rules and security that's surrounding it so that it doesn't uh, doesn't do anything outside of the ordinary. I think that's going to be the key thing and making sure responsible AI is part of part of the discussion for for all of these kind of use cases. Awesome. That's all I had. Um, I'll kind of open up the floor for any questions. Okay, thanks, Akib. that that was amazing. And uh, maybe I'll start the questions uh, out. And I think I've asked this of one of our prior speakers, so I'm going to ask it of you. Um, I think we're all looking at this generative AI as a move away from narrow AI, which everybody was saying, look, AI can only do these very limited things and, and there's lots of things it won't be able to do, to more general AI, um, mm -hmm. which is really closer to replicating how humans think. So we're moving less away, more away from artificial intelligence and closer to human intelligence. And when I you know, the, some of the points you have in your uh, presentation there, you, you talk about humor. It can give you humor. It's got context. It can generalize and it can deal with increasingly complex situations. And, and I totally agree. When I get one of those chat bots, you know, at Rogers, I am like irritated within probably two minutes. <laughs> but when I'm talking to my uh, my chat GPT, I'm quite happy. I, I know that it, that's some wrong stuff going on there, but I'm quite happy and I'm happy to keep going with it. And so in your mind, how close are we getting to general AI with this kind of technology? Yeah, it's it's a good it's a good question because I think it depends on where you're having these interactions. Um, I think from an industry standpoint, I think we're still some ways away. Um, just because there is a lot of uh, scrutiny in terms of how interactions need to be had with a brand. Um, so I don't think they'll necessarily 
open it up to allowing every type of conversation, allowing you to, you know, really dive deep into those more complex kind of interactions with different type of humor, or different, you know, those, uh, that different type of personality that even you can get from a, from your chat GPT solution. Um, because the, the benefit of chat GPT is it can, it can get things wrong and everything's fine. Right. right? Um, it's very clear in that, that it's kind of brought that up right at the forefront. Uh, it's trying its best, right. Uh, versus for an enterprise use case, it can't get anything wrong, uh, mm -hmm. not even one. So that's where it's very, you know, very um, tight in terms of what is allowed and what they're able to kind of roll out for customers because they will never trust something that won't give you 100% of an answer Um the right right time every time right so this is where again you you probably notice things like your google home or your alexa oh no i think i probably kicked off a bunch of people's google homes but um those solutions are going to get better for sure uh you'll be able to see the answers that it will give you will be a lot more custom and yes it will get things wrong but it'll improve and that's fine but when you're ch chatting with some of these enterprise chatbots, you'll probably still notice that it won't be able to do everything um, and still will try to handle specific use cases really well and try to take you down specific journeys. Um, but if you're trying to take it off its path and try a different route for your specific example, that's when you probably get handed over to a human um at, at some point i think we're still pretty far away from it being able to handle those even small deviants in your in your conversation type uh, so that general intelligence won't it maybe exist on a enterprise chatbot but will exist on those kind of uh, you know personal assistance i would say uh, very interesting so uh but we're moving further down that path okay we got some questions coming in um i think maybe akib do you want to can you see them yourself yes yes i see a question from artisher hey art i actually know art uh well <laughs> um question for Akib on the broader topic my company is exploring use cases on chat gpt and similar tools for text generation content review capability streamlining proposal work um project reporting, yeah, all that good stuff. So our, our biggest our reservation at this point is related to the issues of confidentiality. Yeah, uh, Naturally, the more specific the prompts are in the tools, the more useful the outputs. What happens to the data I put in ChatGPT? What solutions do you recommend that I can utilize AI in the way that I want content? So I, I would say, yes, this is a problem everyone has. Um, and the way industries are kind of leveraging this, you can't use chat gpt specifically because uh with specifically chat gpt you're going to you're essentially um allowing them to use all your data um that's why a lot of businesses have actually banned using chat gpt um so what you could use is the underlying technology which is the uh, the large language model uh so you can use uh gpt4 gpt3.5 and then set it up on your own reserved instance um, so you can tune it and it'll sit, you know, even the data that you, uh, you've added to it and you manage will actually be on your specific instance. So that way you don't actually, you're not, you know, relying on, uh, you, you're not opening up your data to, uh, open AI and, and giving them access to that, uh, to that data. So I think there's more of these type of solutions that are kind of popping up more than just open AI, like even Google and. Um, and Microsoft are offering it, Google's offering it in their GCP instances and uh, Microsoft's offering in their Azure instances of being able to kind of set these up, build out your own kind of capabilities. I know Ard, I think you used to work in the nuclear space. OPG has like a, a chatbot solution that they've uh, launched, for example. Uh, internally, of course, um, that's how they were able to kind of do that without having to give up, you know, their data, internal data to, to OpenAI. Thanks. That's great. And I guess uh, George has a question also. Yes. Uh, there are multiple advantage, advantages for enterprises. What are the advantages for customers besides uh, the saving time, which is most obvious? So, uh, 
yeah, saving time, I would say, is obviously the biggest advantage. Um, but then I, I think if you think about like what you're hoping to do with uh, when you call in to a brand um, is going to be saving time, right? Like you don't want to be on hold for an hour to talk to someone to, and then they just tell you the same thing that you would have known or they have to just hit a reset button or something on their side. Um, so I think the saving time is going to be the biggest uh, KPI for uh, for businesses, uh, but then also for consumer. I, I would say the other thing that other than saving time would be uh, the kind of bespokeness of the conversations. Not only like if you think about a human, they wouldn't be able to know every detail about you. Um, they would have to go read through tons of notes to be able to understand uh, how loyal of a customer you are or all the stuff you've bought from that specific company. Um, and then be able to kind of give you a really good experience with these kind of generative solutions. The advantages here are before it even speaks to you, um, it knows if you're, uh, if, if, you know, usually brands do customer segmentation, it would know what type of value customer you are. Is it, are you a super high value customer? Are you, you know, um, you know, high growth customer, all that kind of stuff. It would know what type of customer you are. So it would know how to actually uh, address you and even be able to do things like I'm sure you've probably interacted with um, some of like Uber and stuff. They they would give you discounts. Like my wife gets a different discount on her Uber Eats than I do, right? So I get maybe like 30% off. She gets like 50% off. Um, and, it, and it's because, you know, she might be a high growth customer that they're trying to acquire. Uh, and get on the platform more. So the bot is now able to have all that information in the back of its head. So when it's answering your question, it's able to do a little bit more different bespoke answers um, and give you di different offers that other people wouldn't be able to normally get. Just because it knows your history, it knows how you've interacted or lack of interaction with the brand. And it's able to kind of give those custom offers and uh, that custom experience that uh, a, a human wouldn't be able to have the time to run up on, on on a specific customer to be able to give. Hope that answered your question, George. Thanks, Akib, and thanks, George, for that question. And Bilal, hi, Bilal. Bilal's one of, one of our alumni. <laughs> oh, awesome. So Bilal, your question is, thank, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, from your experience working with clients that have implemented similar solutions such as chatbots, ChatGPT, et cetera, what risk uh, sh should they consider and best practices safeguards they should put in place to prevent issues such as uh, misuse of information, sharing correct generative information with their customers, impact on internal software. Yeah, so that's where our product comes into place. That's where Wisdom kind of sets. We are the chatbot management company. Uh, we are one of very few chatbot management, chatbot operations companies um, in the world. So um, again, the reason why this is important is because uh, people think, you know, the hardest thing is to stand up a chatbot. And that has become actually much cheaper and much easier to do. Uh, everyone here can actually stand up a chatbot in, I would say, in like 10 minutes tops. Uh, you can use one of the no code kind of solutions that are offered by some of the big tech companies and uh, even from the mid market guys. And you can set up a chatbot pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and that's not the problem. The issue is once you've launched a bot, the kind of, like you were saying, the safeguards, you know, responsible AI, what are you doing? How are you answering questions? Uh, you know, what are you doing to improve once you, if you got things wrong uh, or if you're not answering questions? And that's where you need continuous analytics and, and management. So not only do you need to know where the problems are, and that's where the analytics comes into play to be able to say from a, descriptive analytics piece of like, here are, you know, your numbers, this is what is happening, but then also prescriptive and predictive. So being able to say, hey, these conversations are going, becoming more aggressive and aggressive. There's more profanity being put in these, con like maybe we should look at being able to handle these type of customers or these type of, um, these type of use cases that customers are bringing up differently than they are right now. So more predictive in nature or be able to see, hey, this topic is on the rise or this topic's on the drop. Um, but then also prescriptive of like, here is an issue and this is what we think you should do to actually fix this issue, right? 
Um, so preventing that issue happening before you know it becomes a larger issue within the organization, just because you're seeing your customers start talking about something and you're like, mm, such a small volume, I don't need to worry about it. Um, being able to know that that's an issue that pops up right away instead of it being such a small volume, it's not shown up on the radar. Our solutions are able to kind of bring up all those kind of issues. So right now, you would if you had to do it on your own, it's very expensive. You need a large team. You need to build out these models of uh, custom internally uh, to be able to manage a lot of these. So it's a little bit difficult. And that's why you know solutions like Wisdom exist uh, to kind of run some of that for you on your behalf. Okay, thanks. And thanks, Bilal, for that uh, question. Otto, are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah, there you go. Okay, Otto. Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Keith. That was uh, very good. Uh, uh, my question, I have perhaps multiple uh, subpart questions to it, but um, just can you elaborate on the general cost per query uh, for a user to query in uh, 3.5 versus 4.0? Um, I'm imagining with 4.0, you have the different data types. So I would assume that this, the processing will be a little bit more involved. Um, and can you just elaborate on the conversion of the data types, uh, the video and the audio? Does it go into text before it gets um, gets uh, integrated into the uh, uh, for training uh, process? Um, and I have another follow up question, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah, I would say uh, the 3.5 boosted version is what a lot of people are using right now, just because it's substantially cheaper uh, than everything else. Um, I think Google just released a solution within their Vertex solution or, um, that is also relatively cheap compared to the, the market um, that uh, powers Bard uh, within their Palm solution. So uh, I think it's, I, I don't know the top of my head, but I remember it being a fraction of a cent, it's like 0 0.002 cents per token uh, that you'd pay on 3.5. It's a little bit more expensive for GPT-4 um it's like 0.4 cents um per token um and again within the token you can put in a you know pair like there's a, a character limit you can kind of put in put in each one um so what i would say is if you're looking for if, if you're doing a project um i would recommend using the 3.5 boosted version especially if you're not it hasn't it you're not using kind of any multimodal um you know solution mm -hmm. there um and a lot of the right now the gpt4 solution doesn't have the multimodal kind of really activated um so uh, you're going to get you know you know some better solution better responses all that kind of stuff yes uh but we've seen like the 3.5 is pretty good for majority of use cases if you can afford to do gpt4 um which we can um but not everyone can so mm -hmm. i think then it makes sense to uh, to to try it out, um, but once I think well, once the multimodal solution is is enabled, it's going to be a lot. It's going it, there's be specific use cases that you wouldn't be able to do on three point five. So then you would have to migrate over to four. Um, but yeah, the cost we always see this as a the cost is always going to keep dropping. So GPT five comes out, four will drop substantially. Six, it's like. You know, it's like the iPhone, right? It's like your next generation is always going to drop the the previous generation. Great, thanks. Uh, can I ask a, a quick follow up question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah uh, thanks. And uh, so, in general, if the first time a a query has been made to the to the to the bot, and then let's say the second, third, and the tenth and hundredth time, does it like um does it get more cost effective? It's the same type of question being asked, or it's just, it's a flat rate, really? No, it's it's a flat rate. It's going to be yeah. it gets pretty expensive depending on what type. Of, that's why you would recommend doing batch queries. Like even mm -hmm. for us, we're not analyzing it every second. Uh, we're analyzing like our models are running overnight. Um, it's more efficient in terms of like no one's actioning it, actioning these um, these issues on an hourly basis. Anyways, they're actioning it on a weekly cadence, usually a lot of the times. So mm -hmm. for us, we we uh, we run the models overnight to analyze the conversation. So all the conversation that you had, like we're running millions of conversations a day. So like if customers having those conversations today, you would be able to see what actually happened the next day to see, okay, yesterday my customers were asking me about this. 
this is how angry they were. This is how happy they were. This is what they were talking about. You know, this is the, their tone, all that good stuff. So um, we're able to kind of do that on a daily basis for our for our enterprise customers. Um, I I would also kind of um, say like if there's also some specific use cases that you don't necessarily need to use large language models, um, just because I, I I've been in the the space for quite some time. Before large language models, there was language models, mm -hmm. uh, right? That we've been leveraging as well. So if you're looking for if you're looking for a specific a specific use case that just only needs a classifier, yes, large language models can do classification pretty well. Um, but it if you know it's it's even cheaper to do that task with just the general classifier, um, then try to leverage a large language model. That's an example of like a supervised approach. If you're doing unsupervised, if you're using like clustering or topic mm -hmm. modeling in that case, that would be even cheaper than using large. Of course, large language yeah. models can do some of that work. But again, like I think uh, Irene was saying, like those, these are general models. They can do a lot of stuff and that's why they're so expensive. Um, so if you're looking for a specific task that doesn't need that generality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then maybe just use the technology that maybe a little bit more focused on that and it's and it'll probably be a lot cheaper to kind of run that solution right okay thank you and thanks for that question Otto. so so you're doing sort of reinforcement training aki when you go do that overnight batching you're gonna see something coming up and then if it's making a mistake you're gonna fix it you're gonna tell it don't say that or you know that's inappropriate you're gonna flag that somehow right yeah, yeah, yeah. The tool flags it, and then we have um, people that you know. We have data scientists, machine learning engineers, like linguists, analysts generally that are kind of looking at this continuously and saying, "Okay, we found this issue. This is what we need to do to fix the issue. Either it's a uh, we need to go do prompt engineering. There's a lot of hype around prompt, but like the, like what prompts we need to add, or do we need to go actually make some changes on the NLU framework?" Uh, do we need to go change some something in the responses where the linguists are pretty good in terms of I mean, like this is what the response should say? Like there's a lot of different things that can be done. So we have the resources internally to be like, you know, everyone is can be fractionally used on a different task. Um, but based off like what the issue is, you would need maybe a different resource to kind of actually solve that problem. Okay, good. Yeah. And I see Rob has a follow up question on that uh, reinforcement learning <laughs> topic. Yeah, uh, quick question. Learning change the mistakes. Yes. So um, we so the reinforcement model, we don't necessarily use a reinforcement model. Um, it's because we're using um, a semi supervised solution. So what we rely on is we're not giving, it's not like a, one of those tasks where like, here's the end goal, you figure it out and no one's gonna be watching you. Um, there's tons of humans in the background that like making sure it's doing the right things and it's going the right direction. Um, so we're not using reinforcement learning, just to be clear, what, we're do, what we are using is supervised. And then when we're doing the unsupervised machine learning, like the clustering that helps dictate into what actually needs to be put in the supervised solution. So that's why I kind of call it a semi-supervised solution. Um, so that's a good process that we've kind of built internally uh, that determines if there's a new topic that arises that the model that doesn't understand. And then the team it identifies it to the team and then the team goes and says, okay, yeah, this is something we should go train on the supervised solution or says not something we need to worry about right now. This is like, you know, part of seasonality that everyone's asking about uh, uh, like flying cars or something, right? Okay, good. That's good. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Michael, did you have any comments you wanted to make? Yeah, thanks, Akib. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I I was really interested in that $10 million savings. And I guess my question is, you know, in order to really get a lot of savings at, at the enterprise level, we have to promote the use, right? And I think I'm, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of been a person where sometimes I just immediately say, I want to speak to a human, I want to speak to a human, press zero to speak to the operator. Mm -hmm. So just wondering from an analytics perspective, how many sort of uh, issues are completely resolved from the bot? And then regardless of the sophistication of the bot, how many people just ask for this human interaction? And do we see this sort of consistent across industries or does it differ? 
you know, in banking maybe per se than typical retail. I'm just curious about some of the analytics behind this. Yeah, I, I would say today, I would say um, on average ac across industry, um, it's about a 80-20 split. Uh, so 20% of conversations are being automated, 80% are being escalated to a human, um, which is going to change very quickly. Uh, we're seeing that 20% being driven up substantially uh, for customers just because of now how the technology is evolving and allowing more of these complex use cases. Uh, previously, you'd be like, I couldn't, like, the bot will never be able to do that, or it's very difficult for it to do it. Now it's it's more of a question of um, like, how much money do we want to throw at being able to let it answer these type of questions, right? So, um, so now that that industry is kind of shifting towards that, so I think that's it's going to eventually be a flip, right? Um, where eighty percent of the problems are going to be solved by the bot, uh, and only twenty percent of very complex hard use cases are going to be sent to a human. And as you probably remember, when you're talking to you know your service provider on your phone, you're always like you get kind of frustrated. And you're like, all right, I want to speak to a manager. <laughs> there won't be any of those low-level people that will be managing the conversation. It'll always be a manager you get a hold of, right? Because if you're getting, if you're 80% of your conversation being managed by a bot, the 20% that are so complex, you're going to need to speak to someone pretty senior to be able to manage that problem. Um, that's how the future is going to be heading towards. I would say the way um, from a customer experience perspective, we're seeing a massive increase in terms of how customers uh, would prefer speaking to a chatbot. Um, I think the statistic that I have is about 41% of customers prefer to speak to a chatbot than um, speak to a human, uh, just because they can solve their problem uh, rather than being on hold to solve you know, that specific, same problem. I'll give you another, another example. Um, been working, uh, you know, we worked with um, a, you know, um, kind of a helpline where you would have to you have to kind of call in and then you'd be put on hold um, and this is a helpline that you know helps is kind of a, a very high sensitive very risk uh, thing for for you and you would be on hold for hours to be able to speak to someone that can actually help you um, which is is crazy to think about but there's a lot of steps that are standardized that can help people um, that they just may not have access to or they don't know where to look for. Um, so a chatbot solution is, you know, has helped substantially because it even before you get transferred over to a human, just kind of talks about the steps that you can work on in the time being until you're kind of escalate to person. And then a lot of times actually just resolves the problem completely. And then we started noticing, a, um, you know, there's been some um, with some of the launches with, uh, you know, uh, Snapchat and some of these other social medias that have launched uh, AI bots, uh, like ChatGPT like bots, um, have noticed a massive uptick in terms of, uh, you know, youth chatting with chatbots um, and prefer that over like typical counseling or mentorship and all that kind of stuff, just because they have the autonomy or anonymy of not actually worrying that they are getting judged and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's very interesting, like more people are getting more used to ta talking to bots um and that's just part of their you know everyday kind of occurrence and the more that happens um i think generationally uh you will start seeing more people not texting or think they're just kind of you know turning on their apple watch and asking questions and getting answers okay and and it as i said it is kind of um it's not unpleasant talking to a, a generative ai bot um, yeah, you know, so it, it's it, it's not an irritant is my point. So yeah. I think you'll get people increasingly, and like you say, there's no judgment there. If it's sensitive information, maybe people don't want to talk to another human being, like on those yeah. helplines you mentioned. So it's it's interesting. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Otto, again. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. Thank, th thanks. Thanks uh, again for your, for answering all those questions. Very informative. And uh, uh, well. Yeah, I'm coming from an educator's perspective, and uh, you know we're we're doing our best to uh, prepare our students right for what's to come, and it's easy to train and to teach people who are already in like computer science or engineering about it, right? It's easy for them to to absorb it, but uh, like most of my students are are business students, mm. and there's various ways to approach. But in your opinion, how 
what educational tools or skills would you recommend to teach you know, business students to like to learn generative AI, LLM, and chatbot? Like, what would be the the steps to be proficient so then uh, you know they can add value in in the workforce? Yeah, I um, I would say it's it's not as difficult as people would think. Um, I would recommend you first. You don't need to be a data scientist to be you know well versed on chatbots specifically, just because a lot of the the solutions out there they're actually no code um, solutions. So uh, I would recommend you first if you're interested in the conversation space in the chatbot space, uh, go build a bot on your own, right? Uh, very easy to do. And like I said, it takes like 10 minutes. Um, sometimes even part of my interviews, it's one of the questions I would I'll ask, uh, you know, go build, like as part of a case study, go build out a bunch of different bots across some, some different vendors. And then tell me the differences of like what you liked between one versus the other in terms of the way it kind of interacts and then also the build process. So it's very easy to get started um, in that. It's very intuitive. So that's something I would I would definitely recommend. And then if you want to understand some of like how the, the you know the the sausage is made behind the scenes of like how the classifier is answering questions, how large language models kind of work, what is a transformer, you know, why are transformers used in large language, like all that kind of stuff. Um, then there's obviously tons of material online. Um, you know, Coursera work, there's the Andrew Ng's courses um, yeah. that kind of help with uh, in data science and stuff. So I think there's a lot of different online material that you don't necessarily um, need to go get. Like I, I did do, uh, to be fair, I did do my master's in AI management. Um, so uh, that that was a little bit more formal training, but I would say the stuff that I learned there was no different than the stuff that I learned just le on my own on on the internet, right? So I think um, you know everything's available. It's just how willing you are to go learn these things. Like even today, like you probably see, like I, I'm sure there's a lot of students on this call. Um, you're probably seeing some of the things on LinkedIn around like prompt engineering salaries, which are like three, 400 K, uh, for a prompt engineer. And it requires like six months of experience or something like that. Right. So it's, it, it's pretty hilarious, but, um, again, there's prompt engineering courses, right? Like you can go do one of those and they're all free. Um, right. Coursera, Udemy, all those guys, like they're available. Um, so you like, you don't need to be someone that's tenured with 10 years of experience in this space. Um, the space is relatively new and all the content is available, you know, relatively online. So you can get pretty, pretty quickly updated on, on a lot of the stuff. Um, and I would say most importantly, I would say, get your hands dirty, right? Reading it is very different than actually building it. Uh, once you built it, like you understand how the concepts work. Um, you understand like what you also, you'll build up, you know, a preference towards what you actually like doing in the space. Um, and then, and then you can kind of focus on the specific areas and dive deeper into something. I, I always kind of give this example. People come to me all the time and are like, should I go, you know, get us, you know, a master's in stats. I'm like, no, you don't need to do that right now. Like, uh, yes, it would be helpful. Uh, I'm not saying it wouldn't, right. But you don't need to do that to get started, right? Like there's a lot of easier paths to actually get started. And, and it's changing so much all the time, you know, that's the other thing, right? So yeah. the online material would presumably be perhaps more up to date. And, and the experiential learning, the hands-on learning, I think is a really important uh, point that you raise, Akib. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I, I think this is bringing us to a close. I see we got a little bit of drop off. Um, so if, if nobody else has got any more questions, uh, we're going to bring this to a close. So, Akib, thank you so much for your marvelous presentation. Very on point and uh, very interesting. And we'd love to have you back if uh, if you'd consider yeah. coming back maybe later in the year. You can yeah, update us on what's help. been happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a completely different conversation even six months from now, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And thanks to the rest of you for joining us. And we will be having a session on prompt engineering on June 22nd. So if you're interested, you can come back and hear a, a little bit about it. 
Um, otherwise, again, thanks for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And thanks again, Akib. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.